Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Trauma Verification's March Q&A Web Conference. For the best sound quality, please use the phone option for your audio. To join over the telephone, just select telephone in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. Today's webinar is being recorded and the recording will be posted to YouTube shortly after today's webinar. I would now like to introduce Molly Lozada, Trauma Verification Project Manager. Go ahead, Molly. Thank you. Thank you for joining today's webinar, everyone. I'm just going to introduce the team. So Rachel's here with us today. Rachel Tanchez, Megan Hudgens, and Bumi Parikh will be presenting today's uh, webinar. I'm just going to go over some housekeeping things. Uh, continuing education to qualify for CE, you must attend at least 50 minutes of educational content. An email will be sent to all attendees who qualify for CE within 24 hours of the webinar ending with instructions on how to claim those. If during the presentation you have any questions, uh, please email us at cotvrc at facs.org. Um, the goal for today's webinar is to interpret the standards outlined in the resources for optimal care of the injured patient manual to ensure that hospitals have an understanding of the criteria to provide quality care to the injured patient, understand the processes and standards involved in an ACS trauma verification site visit, and how following these will positively impact the quality of care of the injured patient at your trauma center. So we're going to go ahead and get started. So uh, for those of us, or for those of you who are new to the webinar, please um, have a copy of your resources manual available, or if you don't have a hard copy, you certainly can download a copy as a PDF from the website noted at the bottom. Please make sure that you are using a copy of the clarification document and the verification change log in conjunction with the manual. Um, as um, we have reported before, that having these documents will um, provide an updated version, if you will, of the resources manual. The manual is not reprinted. It is the same one that was released in 2014. So any changes that are made to a criteria, <clears throat> excuse me, will be noted in the, in the change log, which is the Excel worksheet at the very bottom here of the screen. And then any clarification to standards that are a little gray or you need a little bit more um, clarification will be noted in the clarification document. Please note that not every single requirement has a clarification nor a change. Uh, website references uh, for trauma centers. Uh, again, if you're new to our webinar, these recordings will be listed on the web page noted here um, in the resources web page. Um, stakeholder public comment. Um, again, if you're new to our webinar, um, we are under um, revision process for our manual and are taking feedback. Um, although we're, we started many of the chapters, we are still we still have that available for folks to submit their um, uh, request for revision. There are a couple of tutorials: uh, becoming a verified trauma center and also a verified trauma center um, having a site visit. I will say that those may. Um, go some revisions in the very near future. Uh, Participant Hub Account Center, um, there's a link here. Rachel will go a little bit more into that and what that um, entails, but um, there is a link for uh, centers to update their information on the Participant Hub and request a site visit, et cetera. And also the expanded FAQ is available on the resources webpage. All questions are pulled directly from the questions that are submitted. There have been no edits made to the contents. If your question is not answered today, the question may require more information and will receive a response from the ACS staff within a week after the webinar. So with that said, I'm going to go ahead and um, pass this over to Rachel Chanchez for scheduling reminders and alternate pathways. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, let's start off with the site visit application. <clears throat> the site visit application is online only, um, and it can be accessed on the following ACS trauma website pages, um, where you would normally get your VRC site visit application, or as Molly mentioned, in the uh, Participant Hub Account Center. And once you click on those links, you'll see that there's the um, Account Center login page. Um, as a reminder, when you're logging on, um, 
you would use the same username and password that you use to access the TCLIP education portal. Um, so it's not the same as your PRQ logins. And once you add your username and um, your login, you'll see that this page will pop up and it'll have um, information um, like the facility information, contacts, etc. cetera. Um, on this page, we encourage you to access this page as often as you need to make any facility or contact updates. And um, if you haven't done so yet, if you could please add a hospital administrator to your contacts, um, whether it be the hospital CEO, the president, the CNO, um, and this is you know, basically so we can send them the confirmations and uh, final reports to your site visit. Um, also, um, you'll see on there, request a site visit. Um, you could click on that and... So can I interject a second, Rachel? Absolutely. Mind? Um, I just want to point out, because um, I know I've been receiving emails and so has Kendra on um, trauma centers, who don't know where to go to update their information. So as Rachel said, that you have to go through the participant hub. However, for centers who are new to the process and um, or new trauma center for that matter, you have to register your facility. I think that's one key that we, we miss out in that step and I apologize for that, but if it's a new trauma center, that has never undergone a site visit with us before or may have gone through a site visit, I don't know, 10 years ago, you're still technically considered a new facility um, because this is a new um, um, program for our, our um, trauma center. So again, if you're new, not a new trauma program manager, but a new facility that's coming on board, make sure you register your facility first because you will not be able to log in unless you register first. Once you register, then a staff person will give you or provide you with login information. Um, the other piece of this is if, if you are a new trauma program manager in already a registered facility and for whatever reason you don't have logins, then you may have to go ahead and reach out to us via email just to get you set up as the new TPM. In most cases, the transitioning trauma program manager does pass that information on and will add you as a uh, primary, um, but in, in as we all know, there's, if there's a transition, transition happening at the last minute, that process is not done, so you will have to email us. Thank you, Rachel. Ah, okay, no, thank you. Okay, um, so to request a site visit, you would click on that link, <clears throat> and a, a short, simple application will drop down, and um, uh, we still ask that uh, that this application that you submit your application 13 to 14 months um, months in advance of the requested site visit dates, and must also be before your expiration date. Um, you'll see here that uh, we ask for preferred dates, and um, and also an alternate pathway. Um, if you have a surgeon or physician who trained outside the U.S. or Canada and they want to participate on the trauma call schedule, um, you would have to add their name here um, uh, in the alternate pathway section. Um, their CVs must also be submitted to the COTVRC inbox as they will be vetted by a subcommittee for eligibility to go through the alternate pathway. And we'll speak a little bit more. I have a couple slides um, a little later on that. Um, and then also on the application, you'll see a section for the orthopedic trauma liaison. All level one trauma centers must um, complete the orthopedic trauma liaison, the OTL form, which can be downloaded on the site visit application. Um, and then you also have to submit that to the CRT VRC inbox with a copy of the OTL's curriculum vitae. Right now we are accepting limited applications for July through September and December 2019. Um, so October and November of 2019 are closed at this time. We're completely full. Um, however, 2020 is wide open. So. And just to clarify, that excludes focused, on-site focus visits. Um, we do honor on-site focus visits for those months that um, may potentially be closed or are limited, just uh, so that we can get your trauma center scheduled. 
Um, so for your, uh, the pre-review questionnaire, your PRQ online access, um, once you submit the application, um, the, you will receive the, um, an email receipt from our office. And in this email receipt are your PRQ logins um, uh, within the confirmation receipt email. Um, also, the online PRQ can be accessed at the following uh, link, and a copy of the PRQ in Word can be downloaded as well. Um, we ask that uh, centers do not submit payment until you receive an invoice. Uh, your center will be billed annually uh, for the trauma quality program fee, and um, you should receive the invoice approximately 30 to 60 days before your site visit. Um, there's a fee structure that's located um, at the link below. Um, scheduling the site visits. Um, visits are being scheduled quarterly. So currently, um, we are almost done scheduling for the third quarter of 2019. Um, we ask uh, that you provide exact dates um, when scheduling your site visit, and um, it, the visit will occur on those chosen dates. Um, you know, every once in a while, um, there may be, you know, maybe a reviewer may need to uh, ask if we could push it up a date or, or push it back a date, and um, we would let you know as soon as possible um, if that happens. But otherwise, um, th otherwise, it should occur on your chosen dates. So um, once the review team has been secured, you'll receive a confirmation email. Um, you'll get this approximately 120 days prior to the scheduled visit. And this will include all your reviewer, um, your reviewer's name, their contact information. Um, and so right now, since the third quarter scheduling is almost complete, those centers who are having a visit in July should be receiving their confirmation within the next week or two. So preparation um, for the reviewers. Um, this ACS travel agent will arrange the site reviewers flights. Um, typically the reviewers will make their, um, their flight arrangements about 20 to 30 days before the site visit. Um, we ask that the hospital arrange and pay for the site reviewers hotel accommodations as well as their ground transportation. So, um, so please contact the reviewers directly within 30 days of the site visit because you'll want to send them hotel information. Um, you'll want to ask for their flight itinerary um, or if they have any dietary restrictions. So any, any logistical information that's going to be needed um, so that you're set up uh, and prepared to have a successful site visit. So we have a couple alternate pathway questions here. Um, let's see, uh, the first question is, do you have to resubmit the same names and CVs for the alternate pathway doctors on your re-verification visit application? And this was from a level one center. Um, if you have a surgeon that has previously been reviewed and approved by way of the alternate pathway at your center, um, we ask that you add their name to the application um, and there's no need to submit their CV because um, we will not send a, a reviewer out there to review them. Um, however, you would need to provide the following at the time of your visit, which would be a list of 36 hours of trauma-related CMEs during the past three years. Um, and this can be met by participation in the center's internal education process and also a performance improvement assessment by the trauma medical director. Uh, to ensure that the patient outcomes compare favorably to other members of the trauma call panel. And to clarify, that's not to, you don't have to submit that to the college, um, just have that available at the time of the on-site visit. Yes. Okay. Okay, so the next um, question is, if I have multiple surgeons going through the APC, Ultimate Pathway, how should I include their info on the PRQ? Um, well, unfortunately, the PRQ allows for only one surgeon to be added on the Appendix um, 6-1 page. So, um, so add the one surgeon to the PRQ, 
And if there are other surgeons um, applying for the alternate pathway or who were previously approved, um, please download a copy of the Appendix 6-1. It's an overflow form and it's on the ACS website and you could submit that form um, and the surgeon CV to the COT VRC um, inbox. And also you should have a copy of these available on site for the team. Um, and again, you only have to submit the CVs if they are um, new surgeons that are gonna be going through alternate pathway. Thank you, Rachel. Um, I just wanna point out that Rachel and I have seen an increase in um, trauma centers hiring um, foreign trained physicians, providers, which again, that's acceptable. We're not saying it's not. Um, however, if um, they've never been through the alternate pathway, one of the things you wanna you want to ensure if you have a site visit coming up within the year or within the next 14 months, correct? Yes. 14 months mm -hmm. that you know if you do have someone who's never gone through the alternate pathway and you're going to utilize the alternate pathway process, that you submit that well in advance. And I do realize that oftentimes you're not told until the last minute or six months prior, but you want to make sure that we get that information because the process to, so there's two stages to that. The first stage is that their, their CV and um, a, a letter is submitted to the, the office and that is reviewed by, um, there's a subcommittee of the VRC, which is or actually the COT at large, but the VRC, where it's going to, their CV will be reviewed by the neurosurgeon committee or the orthopedic com committee, and they're the ones who determine whether or not their training is equivalent to that of the U.S., and there's often time, which Rachel and I have gotten involved, is that, you know, there's um, a little nuance to their, their uh, training, and there's a lot of back and forth, and sometimes it takes time because, again, they're foreign trained, and they may have to go abroad to get that information. So just keep that in mind when you are submitting information to us that it may take um, a little bit more time than, than we anticipate. So we're going to go ahead and make <clears throat> an announcement for the next webinar. Um, we'll be scheduled for Thursday, April, I'm sorry, for Tuesday, April 30th will be the webinar. The deadline to submit questions will be Thursday, April 11th, um, and our standard time will be noon um, Central Standard Time. So with that said, I am going to hand this over to Ms. Megan Hudgens for a general question. Hello, everybody. This is Megan Hudgens here for the general questions. And we do have a lot of these today, so strap in, get comfortable. And we are going to start off with a question about drowning patients. Can near drownings be included in the total number of admitted patients if they are consulted by the pediatric trauma service? And this is for a level one. So for verification purposes, uh, and you'll note this on page 67 of the orange book if you have it with you, uh, the volume admission should exclude uh, patients admitted for drowning, poisoning, foreign bodies, asphyxiation, or suffocation. And to extend this a little bit, uh, the, extend the uh, scope of the question, um, in regard to the trauma surgeon's involvement in these types of cases, they should be involved early to evaluate whether there are any traumatic injuries and also uh, the added benefit for rapid resuscitation if that happens to be needed. Here's a question on advanced practice providers. Are trauma advanced practice clinicians, APCs, required to see and perform tertiary exams on patients admitted to orthosurgical services? So no, this isn't a requirement uh, for APCs or, AP, uh, AP, APCs or APPs. Uh, most of our criteria for APPs, and I believe we get into this a bit uh, later in the presentation as well, uh, have to do with uh, ATLS, OPPE, things like that. Uh, as far as tertiary exams, like for PIPs purposes, um, that's not a, a requirement for APPs. They may, of course, participate in the PI process, however. Here's another one on APPs. So, can APPs perform the daily rounding on ICU trauma patients after the plan of care is established by the surgeon? This is from a level two. So there's no specific requirement for APPs uh, performing the daily rounding on ICU patients. Uh, they may round on ICU trauma patients with a physician who is responsible for signing off on notes or examinations. But uh, yes, they may. Uh, they, we don't have a specific requirement about that. 
Here's one on ATLS certification status. Does current in ATLS mean current as, the, as of the date on the card or within the allowed six month grace period after expiration? And this is from a level one. Uh, so this is a bit different from uh, other criteria that we have, like for example, board certification where we accept uh, like eligibility as meeting the criteria. Uh, for ATLS, uh, for verification purposes, current status is gonna be based on the date that is noted on the ATLS card. So we would not honor the grace period in that instance. So is there any projection that Optimal resources revisions will require all general trauma surgeons to be current in ATLS. And this is from a level two. So in respect to the chapter revision process, and I think we get a, at least a few questions about the chapter revisions every month. Uh, but uh, for this particular question, we can say that current ATLS certification won't be mandated for all trauma surgeons. Uh, the trauma medical director will still be required to be current in ATLS. Uh, and any changes that uh, come out of the chapter revisions, of course, uh, we will disseminate as soon as we have more information. And of course, there will be a year grace period uh, from the time those changes go into effect. And here's a question on freestanding emergency departments. Our facility is looking to acquire and take over operations of a freestanding ED that will become a provider-based ED. Uh, if a patient was to walk in the offsite provider-based ED and meet the highest trauma team activation criteria, would the trauma surgeon on call be expected to evaluate the patient at the offsite facility? If not, what would the expectation for care uh, for care for cases uh, be in this example? This is from a level three. So the attending surgeon isn't expected to travel to the offsite facility to manage that patient. Um, the freestanding ED should have guidelines in place to stabilize the patient and expedite transfer to the nearest verified trauma center that's capable of managing the patient's injuries. We don't have any specific criteria as far as freestanding EDs go, however. So um, like I said, this is just a should. And we actually have another question about freestanding emergency departments. Uh, when patients are initially treated at a freestanding provider-based ED and are then admitted to the main campus for definitive care, is that considered a transfer, direct admit, or admission? So, uh, for verification purposes, if the patient was transferred from the off-site facility uh, or freestanding ED uh, to the main trauma center, this would be considered a transfer. And to clarify, inter-facility or inter-hospital transfers are defined specifically as patients who are transferred in, out, to, from another facility, whether that's a sister hospital, it, it could be a freestanding ED, private physician's office, wherever. And as a reminder, to tie this back to uh, criteria, all transfers must be reviewed through the PIPs process as per CD43. And here's one on non-surgical admissions. Do ED obstetrical admits count as non-surgical admissions? If so, is there a minimum length of, length of stay time required to count towards an admission? So for verification purposes, I'm saying that a lot today, uh, patients who do not meet the NTDS or your trauma center's inclusion criteria, whatever those happen to be, and observations uh, discharged within 23 hours can't be counted towards the trauma patient admission total uh, requirement in the PRQ. So patients who uh, do meet NTDS or the inclusion criteria and are admitted to a surgical service or a non-surgical service with a stay of greater than 24 hours, uh, those may count towards the admission totals uh, in the PRQ in chapter two. And another one on non-surgical admissions. Do non-surgical admissions need to be reviewed at the time of admission or can the TMD review them post-discharge? So certainly we wanna make sure that you can evaluate the case like based on the entire scope of care uh, from start to finish. So yes, definitely uh, the non-surgical admissions may be reviewed post-discharge so that the entire scope of care can be evaluated. And another one on non-surgical admissions. Uh, we recently had a verification visit, February 2019. Uh, the lead reviewer indicated that non-surgical admissions were acceptable under certain circumstances, such as low impact mechanism, isolated injury, i.e. fractures, 
all were to be reviewed should ensure that consults are appropriate and timely uh, timely care was timely and care was appropriate based on direction from the ACS in the past our trauma committee has always tried to steer admissions to the surgical service with a consult to medicine unless medical priorities existed has the ACS loosened its stance relative to non-surgical admissions uh, so uh, the service for non-surgical admissions is going to differ uh, by trauma centers based on that trauma center's in admission policy. Ideally, for best practices purposes, patients with isolated injuries or injuries due to a low impact mechanism, uh, like falling from bed, for example, uh, should be admitted to a surgical service to rule out any any additional injuries. However, uh, the center may admit the patient to, me uh, to medicine with a surgical consult. Both me methods are totally acceptable. The big takeaway um, the thing that we really want to stress is that all non-surgical admissions should be evaluated for appropriateness of care, and if it's over 10%, must be evaluated for appropriateness of care. And here's one on peer review meetings. Does there need to be a separate sign-in sheet for PIPs committee meeting and M&M conference for facilities that are peds and adults? And this is from a level one. Important to note, uh, just for context with this particular question, is this was a combined uh, level one adults and pediatric center. So to tie to that uh, specific center's uh, question, for combined adult and pediatric trauma centers, the peer review meetings may be held on the same day. That's totally fine. Uh, however, there must be a clear start and end time for each meeting, and both and both segments of that meeting must have separate minutes. Uh, trauma panel members are not required to attend both meetings. There may be a representative, and this can be the TMD or other de uh, designee or representative from the adult program or from the pediatric program who attends the other program's meeting. And in these instances, the TMD must ensure that information is disseminated to the other panel members. And another one on peer review meetings. What's the best way to differentiate between PI slash operations if the meetings are held together or consecutively? Uh, so for the purposes of a site review, uh, what you're going to want to provide to the reviewers would be like a second sign-in sheet or just there should be a clear delineation in the minutes between PI and operations. Those will be totally sufficient. And here's one on OPPE. Besides trauma, emergency medicine, orthopedic, and neurosurgery OPPEs, do the trauma centers need to do OPPEs for anesthesia, radiology, and PM&R? I think we get, uh, we get these questions pretty regularly. Uh, so to clarify, um, the specialty director, uh, the neurosurgery liaison, the orthopedic, et cetera, et cetera, those would be the ones to actually conduct the OPPE for that specialty. But as they are caring for trauma patients, we would want the TMD to have some kind of sign off in that process, that's where the criteria comes in. And in some centers, this can be managed by the medical staff office, that's totally fine. Uh, mostly we just wanna make sure that there is some trauma involvement in that process. Oh. And here's a question on the PRQ. So if you had weaknesses or deficiencies in your verification visit that cleared with the focus visit, how do you list them in your PRQ? And this is from a level two center. Uh, so the focus visit is basically tied to your original re slash verification visit uh, addressing the deficiencies that were cited in that original visit so if your deficiencies and weaknesses were addressed during the focus visit you're not required to list the deficiencies and weaknesses from the original visit uh, reviewers that are coming on site for your upcoming visit after that focus visit and your verification being extended um, they'll receive copies of the initial and focused reports from the previous visit cycle. Uh, for focus by mail resolutions to extend the scope of that a little bit, uh, reviewers will receive copies of both the initial report and the corrective action. And here's one on the PRQ again, specifically for the pediatric section. PEDS PRQ, how do we fill out seemingly duplicate areas, ED nursing, pediatric nursing, ICU, PICU, uh, need to enter adult unit info? No, no, you don't need to enter the adult unit info there. Uh, so trauma se centers seeking separate adult level one and pediatric level one site visits are required to complete separate PRQs. Um, it may be confusing, I know, in that, um, you know, chapter 10 is going to have the PICU section and then chapter 11 is going to have the ICU section. Um, these do have different questions 
and they should be answered in accordance with pediatric data only. So yeah, um, the adult, the, the information about the adult center should be in specifically the adult PRQ, and for your pediatric verification, the PRQ should be uh, pediatric data only. And here's a question on social work. A uh, social worker is required for a level one trauma center. Do they need to be in hospital 24 seven or as long as we have the ability to access them? We have social work 24 seven in our psychiatry unit. Can, uh, can that be our resource during, I think that's midnight shift. Um, sorry if I got that acronym incorrect, but a uh, social worker should be available 24 seven in a level one and two trauma center. And again, that is a should. Um, uh, a must would denote a criteria, but it should is just, you know, best practice, ideal guidelines. Um, the VRC does not require them to be dedicated to the trauma program. So the practice that you describe uh, with them being uh, available 24 seven in the psychiatry unit, that is totally fine. Here's one on specialty services. Level two, if they lose a specialty service such as oral maxillofacial, uh, when do they report to the change to the ACS and what is the process? If the specialty service is not available, would it be appropriate to hire locums and have a contingency plan for uh, short-term coverage? Uh, so that's from a level two. So uh, credential locums may provide coverage for the required specialty services. However, a contingency plan as stated in the second part of that sentence would not be acceptable. Uh, as a reminder, these clinicians must be available at bedside within a, spe a specified time when the attending surgeon requests a consult. And any program changes of the TMD and TPM must be reported to the ACS as soon as they occur. As a, a, and this is a general practice, really. Um, as Rachel noted earlier, we want to make sure that we have correct contacts so that we can send you information related to your visit and make sure it's getting to the correct person. And here's a question about state representatives. Uh, will the state ACS representative be able to answer questions or who would be a contact person? Is there a state representative from the ACS? Um, so the ACS does not actually have a state representative per se. We do have the state committee on trauma representatives, the chairs and vice chairs for each state. Uh, they do not, however, uh, attend site visits by point of course. Uh, you, may, uh, you may invite them, uh, it's not required, but you may invite them. Um, to extend on that a little bit, a staff member of the, v of the ACS may occasionally attend a site visit, it's not the norm, uh, but the center will be notified in advance. If an ACS staff member will be attending, we're not going to surprise you. Uh, if there are any questions regarding your trauma center's designation process or status, uh, we advise you to contact your state department of health official any questions regarding the verification process and or standards, you, uh, you can uh, send an email to uh, cotvrc at facs.org. Here's a question on direct admits. Should transfers coming from inpatient status at one center go through the ED at the higher level of care receiving facility? Uh, this is from a level two. So uh, the VRC recommends that patients who have been transferred with a full workup at another facility still be assessed in your emergency department just for the additional opportunity to identify further injuries. And here's one on trauma activations. We are preparing for a consultative visit for a level three. Is there a minimum number of trauma activations required? Uh, so there's not a minimum number of activation categories. Most trauma centers will typically have three activation tiers, and this may include the consultation level or tier. And uh, typically there's gonna be highest level, uh, highest level activation, limited activation, and a consultation. But of course, this depends on your center. Here's another one on trauma activations. Is there a requirement for someone from the PICU to attend highest level of activations in a pediatric level one trauma center? And um, no, there's not. Uh, the composition of the activation teams will vary by trauma center, whatever your criteria are. Uh, who participates on the team will be defined by each trauma center. And another one on trauma activations. For limited tier activations, if the trauma PA responds with the trauma surgeon, can he or she document surgeon response in his note? Uh, this is for a level two. And yes, th this would be acceptable. And another one on trauma activations. 
has the following level one activation criteria been removed by the ACS? Uh, gunshot wound of extremities proximal to the elbow or knee from a level one. Yes, and we, uh, we do apologize for any confusion about this. Um, so gunshot wounds of extremities proximal to the elbow or knee are no longer a part of the requirement for highest level of activation. I believe this is noted in the clarification document, uh, but yes, that is no longer a part of the uh, requirement. And again, on trauma activations, does the trauma surgeon on call have to see every trauma activation regardless of level of activation? So um, for highest level of activation, the attending surgeon on call must respond within 30 minutes. Uh, the, uh, for limited activation or consult, uh, the attending surgeon on call must respond to the limited level of activation based on your institution's guidelines. And these guidelines must include the injuries the trauma surgeon is expected to respond at bedside, not by phone, within a specified time. And here's one on trauma call. We have a vascular surgeon who is also boarded in general surgery who takes call for us. Is he required to do general surgery cases other than emergent general surgery while on call to continue to be eligible for trauma call? Uh, no, this isn't a requirement. So the TMD will determine who will participate on the trauma call panel in accordance with the verification standards. And uh, it is, uh, uh, yeah, so it, it's not a requirement. Here's one on the trauma registry. A patient is activated as a level one MVC, unresponsive, patient experienced VFib arrest pre-hospital with ROSC. Patient was resuscitated by the trauma team with a full workup and no identifiable injury. Patient was sent to the cath lab and expired one week later, made comfort care only. Uh, should this patient be included in the registry? Should it be attri an attributed trauma death? And this is from a level two. Entry into the registry is gonna be dependent on your hospital's policies. If the patient was discharged and expired a week later, uh, it wouldn't be counted as a death since it didn't occur during the scope of the patient's care there. Uh, if the patient was admitted to the hospital and di died while on a surgical or non-surgical service, then it would be reviewed as a death. And again, on the trauma registry, the FTE for trauma registrar are 500 to 750 for admitted patients. This does not make sense because there is still a lot of time and effort on non-admitted patients. Uh, and this is from a level two. So there's been a lot of discussion on this requirement and um, it, it is currently being reviewed by the chapter revision core group. Uh, potential changes may be coming. And uh, again, we will disseminate that information as soon as we have more to give. Here's one on trauma staff. Is it possible for a trauma registrar to hold the position of PI coordinator or does the PI coordinator have to be a nurse? And this is for a level one. Uh, the VRC does not have any specific requirements regarding the trauma PI coordinator position. And so, yes, a, a trauma registrar may hold the position of PI coordinator, but having said this, it would be advisable to not have the same person in both positions as it may impact the registry support staff requirement that we were discussing before uh, with one FTE for 500 to 750 patients admitted. Here's one on non-accidental trauma. What are the requirements for the trauma service in the care of pediatric non-accidental trauma cases? Does the trauma service need to remain on the case until discharge or may they sign off after medically cleared? Uh, these patients can remain in-house for a length of time due to social issues. Uh, so yes, the VRC agrees that it would be reasonable once the injuries have been identified and treated by the trauma team to sign off or formally transfer when the acute care injury, or the acute injury is no longer uh, the reason for the pediatric patient being in the hospital. And here's one on site visit process. So, uh, so I am asking if we have a patient who has an ISS over 25 with pulmonary contusions, pneumothorax, grade three liver laceration, and splenic laceration. So this would be a patient that fits in more than one category for review. Uh, which, uh, which is the most appropriate category for this chart to be placed in? How would you decide? And this is a question we get a lot. Um, but one thing to keep in mind is that if the case is a mortality, uh, it should be categorized as a mortality for case review purposes, regardless of any other potential classification that may uh, may apply to this case. Uh, if not, if um, this was ISS 25 over 25 with survival, 
uh, the, the chart may be placed in whichever category seems most appropriate. One thing that we always try to uh, say is not to double dip. You don't want to place the same chart in multiple categories. As a recommendation, you could flag it as a multi-system injury. And another one on site visits. Must a center level up in succession, i.e., level three to one, uh, level, uh, level three to two to one, or can a center go directly for, to level one from a level three? Does the ACS recommend? So theoretically, this is possible. Um, so you could technically go from a level three to a level one. We're, we're not going to like deny your application on those grounds. Uh, this would be a substantially big leap. Uh, than going from a level three to a level two or two to a one. Uh, we don't have any specific recommendations regarding this, but what we will say is that it is highly advisable that you undergo a consultation review beforehand just to ensure that the facility is in compliance with all level one criteria during the verification site visit. And here's another one on site visits. Do the reviewers pull the data on elderly with mechanical fall and isolated hip fracture as they are admitted on hospitalist services? This is from a level two. Uh, reviewers do not pull data. So this may be referring to the medical records for non-surgical patients admitted to the hospitalist. Um, going with that in mind, if uh, elderly patients with mechanical falls and isolated hip fractures meet the NTDS inclusion criteria and are part of your admission policy, the medical records for these patients would be reviewed at the time of the site visit and data on those patients should be reported in the PRQ. For verification visits, is it necessary to have all meeting handouts and minutes or can we simply log on to our uh, web-based site and show the handouts to the reviewers when asked? Uh, so yeah, you're certainly welcome to have digital copies of the meeting and minutes documentation available for reviewers at the time of the site visit. We are all for saving trees. So yeah, that is totally fine. And one more on site visits. Uh, we will not have our first TQIP report until March. Our verification visit is in early July. We have two trauma meetings in between this time. How much of a drill down is expected with that timing? And this is from an L3. So the purpose of the TQIP primer or report is to help frame the discussions about TQIP participation and results and to foster consistent understanding among the reviewers and the hospital about the components of TQIP. So your center will not be required to do a drill down prior to the site visit. However, uh, you, want, you do want to ensure that you can speak to your center's TQIP report, uh, any outliers that may apply, etc. And we're through the woods. Those were all the general questions. So I'm going to uh, now turn uh, the presentation over to my colleague, Bumi Parikh, for some more specific CV-related questions. All right. Hi, everyone. I will be presenting on the CV-related questions for this month's webinar. We're almost through, everyone. So the first question is on trauma admissions. Do admissions that are less than 24 hours still count toward our total number of admissions for one year? So this was specifically from an adult trauma center um, for, for the verification reporting period. If the length of stay is less than 24 hours and the patient was not admitted as a trauma patient, this would not be counted in the trauma admission volume number. The next question is on patient arrival time. So the patient arrival time is when the patient arrives in the ED or when the trauma team starts to treat the patient. So once again, for verification purposes, this is referring to the highest level of activation for when the attending surgeon is required to respond and it's tracked from patient arrival in the ED. So the next question is on diversion. When reporting the time the hospital ED is on diversion, what should be reported? And is this just for the reporting year? So every time your center is on diversion, your program should specifically document these three main things. And that includes the trauma surgeon's involvement, the reason for the diversion, whether that's lack of resources, equipment failure, or internal hospital disaster. Um, and in addition, we should also, you should also document the start and end dates and times of the notification to EMS, hospital personnel, and other trauma centers in the area. So all of this information will be documented in the PRQ in Appendix 3, Trauma Bypass Occurrences. So this is specifically in reference to CD6, or 
36, which is um, that all instances of diversion must be reviewed through the PIPs process with the goal of maintaining a rate of less than 5% based on the whole reporting year. So the next question is on transfer agreements. Are level ones that rarely transfer out, so for instance, two specialized cases per year, required to have transfer agreements with the receiving facility? And this is for a level one. So um, the short answer is yes, transfer agreements are essential and um, are required since they protect the trauma center and patient from legal actions. So um, as a note, there can just be one all-encompassing transfer agreement um, that specifically addresses all of the noted standards above. The next question is on limited activations here. So once the level two is activated and the ED physician receives this head CT scan that shows a small subdural hematoma as the only injury, can the ED physician just notify the neurosurgery or does the trauma surgeon need to be notified as well and be responsible for showing up in 30 minutes? This was for a level two. So specifically for this scenario, the injuries and response time for one, the attending surgeon and or neurosurgeon will be required to respond will be based on your institution's specific guidelines for the limited tier and level two activation. Um, and as a reminder, all of these occurrences must be monitored through the PIPs process. And I just want to add that for the neurosurgery, um, there is a requirement that they are to respond within 30 minutes. So I'm going to defer based on this um, criteria here, 516, <clears throat> excuse me. So again, if um, neurosurgery has a requirement of 30 minutes, and again, that will be based on institution-specific criteria. So um, based on those injuries, if they require the neurosurgeon, that's what the expectation is. Um, in some centers that have the PA, advanced practice provider, PA, neurosurgery uh, resident uh, response, and that's also acceptable. Again, it just has to be documented in the guidelines that they're gonna be responding. Thank you. Thanks, Molly. So the next question is also similar to the previous slide. So on a level two activation, if the ED calls the trauma surgeon to discuss the patient in the ED, but does not request his presence at bedside, can the trauma surgeon not come, or would this be considered a fallout of the trauma surgeon? This is for a level two. So as mentioned on the previous slide, once again, the attending surgeon's response will be based on your institution's specific guidelines for the limited tier. So these guidelines must include the type of injuries and the, and the time for when the attending surgeon is required to respond. And as a reminder, phone calls are not an acceptable method for this. And um, once again, all of these occurrences must be reviewed through the PIPs process. The next question is on TPMs. So for hospitals that hold separate level one adult and level one pediatric verifications, are there specific criteria that surveyors will be looking for to demonstrate that each survey has a separate and dedicated TPM? Is it acceptable for both programs to share one budget and staff with one TPM overseeing, supervising the entire department. So to answer the second part of the question first, uh, it is acceptable for combined centers to have a shared trauma budget. However, there should be clear delineations between the adult and pediatric programs. So for instance, if you have a total amount of, um, X amount of budget for your tra trauma program, a certain amount should be specifically de dedicated to the adult program and then a specific amount should be dedicated to the PEATS program. Um, however, um, the adult level one and pediatric level one trauma centers are each required to have a full-time and dedicated trauma program manager. These positions cannot be shared. The next question is on neurosurgery backup schedule. So we have two questions regarding this for this month. So neurosurgery is dedicated to the facility, um, this is for level one, with in-house um, neurosurgical residents, um, and that's 24 seven. So is a backup call schedule required? And another question on this was, if you have a dedicated neurosurgeon covering only one hospital, do you need a published backup call schedule? So if there is a dedicated neurosurgery call, there must be a published backup call schedule or a contingency plan. 
and this is CDs 8.3 and 8.5. So the next question is on pediatric trauma surgeons. So do pediatric trauma centers require pediatric trained surgeons or can a credentialed general surgeon willing to provide surgical services suffice? This is for a level two. So um, to answer the level two question, um, there must at least be one surgeon who is board certified or eligible for certification by the ABS according to current requirements in pediatric surgery. Uh, however, in level one centers, there must be two of these surgeons that are um, board certified or eligible um, for certification by the ABS according to current requirements in pe pediatric surgery. Um, however, also all the other surgeons that um, participate in this may be credentialed by the institution to provide care to the pediatric population. And the, the above is also true and applicable to combined centers. The next question is on cardiopulmonary bypass. So can a level two facility ask for a waiver for CV surgery and bypass equipment? Um, this is for a level one. So um, no, the VRC does not grant any sort of waivers for this requirement. So the expectation is that in level one and level two trauma centers, if the equipment is not available or present, the trauma center must have some sort of contingency plan that includes immediate transfer to an appropriate center. And once again, all these occurrences must be reviewed through the PIPS process. The next question is on radiologist liaisons. So um, the question is, I'm hearing conflicting information regarding if a radiologist liaison needs to fit in on the peer review group for a level three. Um, so there is no requirements for this for level three trauma centers. However, for level one and level two trauma centers, the radiology liaison is required to attend 50% of the peer review meetings, and that's CD 1139. The next question is on ICU coverage. Um, so follow up to the February webinar regarding patients admitted to the ICU needing to be seen by a credentialed provider within 15 minutes. Would a hospitalist credentialed to provide care in our ICU meet this criteria? So yes, a hospital would be allowed to um, provide care to the trauma patients in the ICU um, and should be able to respond in 15 minutes. The next question is also on ICU coverage. So for a level two, can trauma APPs qualify for the 15 minute ICU bedside response? So um, both the surgeons and the trauma APPs are in house 24 seven. So, and this is for a level two. So no, the APPs cannot be used to qualify for the in-house ICU physician's bedside response time. Um, however, this coverage may be done by an appropriate, appropriately supervised senior surgery resident or an in-house trauma attending credential to provide critical care. So the next question is on APPs. Um, must APPs have current ATLS if not providing initial trauma assessments? This is for a level two. So if the APP is not clinically involved in the initial evaluation of the resuscitation of trauma patients, there's no requirement to have current ATLS certification. And that's CD 1186. So we have several questions on universal alcohol screening for this month. So um, the first question is on, do you have to run an alcohol screening on all trauma patients, including ground level falls with head bleed? This is for level three. So if these patients are part of your institution's inclusion criteria, then yes, they must receive a screening for alcohol. So another question was, if a patient has documented ESPER, but it states unable to assess and no further interventions, does this attempt count? So yes, this will be count and it, should, it must be documented. Um, this is also noted on the clarification document and the verification change log, which is found on the website, um, and it mentions that screening is applicable to eligible patients who are defined as participatory. And as a note, once again, these occurrences must be monitored through the PIPS process. Another question was, uh, when screening for alcohol, is it acceptable to use urine screen instead of blood? So yes, both of these um, screening tools would be acceptable. And um, these tools can also be determined by your institution. 
So the last question is on screening brief interventions. So for level one and level two trauma centers, does the ACS specify the percentage of trauma patients that must receive SBIRT? This is for our level two. Um, so as noted in the clarification document and the verification change log for CD 18-3, at least 80% of all trauma patients who are admitted with a stay greater than 24 hours must receive an alcohol screening. And of those patients, any of those patients with a positive screening must receive an intervention. So this concludes our presentation for this month's webinar. And we're gonna go ahead and give this back to Clara to close this out this month. Thank you, Trauma Verification staff, and thank you everyone for attending today's webinar, Trauma Verification's March Q&A web conference. If you have any other questions, please contact cotvrc at facs.org. On behalf of Trauma Verification and our presenters, thank you for joining us today and have a great rest of your day.